Hello and welcome back to the Handstand Cast with me, Emmett Lewis, and my co-host, Mikael Christy Anson. Ooh. How are things, Mikael? Uh, they're actually, you should be able to see how they are. I'm still seated right, right across the table from you. I so. know. Uh, we're like, we are in this, we have this weird inter-period where lockdown wasn't anymore in Ireland. And Mikael has come over to Ireland to uh, film some top secret projects. And now they've now that he's here, they've announced that they're locking the country back down. So Rip. we're we are back to uh, March the nine hundred and fifth of July. Indeed. Uh, but then we have a Michael in uh, in Ireland, so it's going to be cool. But uh, yeah, we're now sitting in my kitchen doing a podcast. Indeed. So what Actually, are we talking about on, today? We should have broke the illusion. We are now sitting at the temple on the mountainside <laughs> in the snow, recording a podcast for your amusement. Exactly. Yeah. And we're, we're melting all the snow just with like meditation powers alone. Yeah, because held a handstand for six hours yeah. while in meditation. <laughs> <laughs> that was the sound of like the ice melting underneath my mighty palms. Yeah, the sound you're probably actually hearing in the background is the Dublin seagulls being fucking loud. Fuck those guys. God damn it. Like, they're really? one of those things. They're a protected species, but if this stuff goes on, I'm going to have to buy a drone <laughs> with a flamethrower attached to it and deal with them. Uh, you can eat them afterwards. Like... Like you'll basically make him crispy on the way down. Apparently, this is a uh, probably getting delving a bit into my personal family history, but I'll tell the story anyway. So, <laughs> my dad and my uncle, when they were teenagers, they were into bird watching, and they'd go down. There was a nature reserve in Ireland that was uh, called Bull Island, and they'd go camping there when they're fifteen, sixteen, and that kind of thing. And I can tell this story now because my dad is dead, so. Uh, you can't get maybe busted. But anyway, <laughs> they started with they'd start off bird watching. They'd keep they had a book that would tell them all the migratory birds of Ireland. When you see them, they go and try and tick them off. But then one year they after they ticked them all off, they decided we should try and eat one of every bird. So they went <laughs> up there with an air rifle and proceeded to uh eat and then comment on every bird that they could. And I think they ticked them all off with this. They said seagull was the worst thing they've ever eaten. And uh Darkness. Put it in context, this was like Ireland in probably the 40s or the 50s at that time. Yeah, but it, was, it would have been the 50s then. And like, yeah, just, uh, yeah, seagulls probably weren't eating like fried chicken and garbage water so much. So mm. you can only imagine that that uh, seagull quality has gotten worse. Yeah, I could, could, could see that being a thing. That is absolutely. So uh, that's the theme start. for our episode is uh, what birds have you eaten <laughs> in a handstand? <laughs> Let us know in the comments yeah. below. <laughs> Let us know. Dial us in. Uh, so anyway, we are going to do a quick question answer episode to answer all your questions. As usual, uh, if you want to ask us any questions, DM them to us on Handstand Factory on Instagram or either to me or Mikhail and we'll get to them. Uh, you can also voice note us questions if you find us on anchor.fm. You can find that on our website on the podcast section. Uh, check it out other than that uh, yeah we just jazzed up the podcast section on the website with all the transcripts and everything there so if you go to the handstand factory and find the podcast uh, section there you can find uh, transcripts and references and everything else if you haven't found them yet and if you're looking for some of the stuff we reference uh, yeah other right. than that I suppose let's get to it yeah so so do, what do people want to know what do people want to know uh, some long questions I think today uh, for your brackets, great podcast. Can you talk a little about bit about the sternum in queue? I see that my ribs stick out a bit compared to more professional hand balancers. Uh, was I born with the wrong parents, or am I not sucking in enough? Uh, and then there's a second question that goes to this as well. Uh, can you share your thoughts on rib in in handstand? Uh, for example, is it affecting the efficiency in a straight handstand? How do you train to get the ribs in? Okay, now I am going to destroy your ribs in. <clears throat> um, it's it's one of the cues that frustrate me the most is the ribs in thing because, um, like, they're like you cannot move your ribs in unless you move your shoulders as well. This is the primary thing. Like moving the ribs in means closing the shoulder angle, plain and simple. Like so, you you basically if you're pulling your sternum backwards, you will be rounding the upper back to some degree. And that is going to bring your, just basically going to close your shoulder angle by itself without actually moving the, what's it called, um, the shoulder flexion. So you're, you're not closing shoulder flexion, but you're moving the thoracic spine from a position which your, your ribs are out in um, 
And when, if you do that, you can just look at yourself in the mirror from the side. If you move your, your arm into flexion and elevation, more or less as far back as it goes, and then you try that you, if, and if you just continue there, you're going to see that your, your ribs will start flaring out. And if you want to pull them back in, you need to bring your shoulder angle slightly or close your shoulder angle to some degree. And that is the thing that people don't understand. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Emmett. Like, yeah. uh, and and like the, especially the what's it called? Like the two open handstand, as we've discussed before, where you kind of complete the handstand line by shooting the ribs out and then letting the thoracic spine take out the last piece of flexion. Where you do then uh, kind of disengage the hard work that your mid traps need to do to get into the full position uh, without flaring the ribs. This is primarily the problem. Like either people don't have the strength there or they lack the mobility to even reach that position with a rounded upper back, meaning the flexibility of the of the actual shoulder flexion. And then they take out those last 10 or 5 or 20% with thoracic spine. And the big problem is it seems straight because if you draw a line on the back of the body from the back of the wrist to the hip, it'll look straight. But most of the time, the ass or feet will hang over and the chest will be over on the other side. So close your shoulder angle. That is basically what you need. And to be able to do so, you need the strength in the upper back to be able to carry then uh, the body in that closed position. Yes. Yeah. I think there's one interesting thing to think about on this one. There is a flexibility requirement. And there's a nice little test. I have it on my YouTube, the shoulder mobility test for hands on. You can see a non-bearded Emmett from uh, many years ago demoing that. And it will just identify if any of the muscles are actually tight. Now, let's just pretend you have the ideal muscles and the ideal range of motion to be able to do a perfectly straight handstand with the ribs in. And when you go inverted, the ribs start to stick out. We can think about what's happening is that a stretched muscle, a muscle that is under a stretch, will generally be weaker than a muscle that's in its mid-range. And if we are trying to get into a flexed shoulder position with a close and pull down ribs, it means the mid-back will be slightly stretched more than it will be in a, this shorter position. So one of the things that is happening there is the muscle groups maybe not strong enough to maintain the flexion mm. that's required to actually get there. So it could be one of these uh, get stronger positions. Uh, another thing to note is there is difference in rib anatomy. Yeah. Like it is, Important if you one. you see this in some styles of handstand, you see there's some schools of people, I'm trying to think of someone off the top of my head who coached this way. I think Sammy Deneen, Max Sammy mm -hmm. D, and Yuval have it a bit, where they really hollow the midsection in their handstand, and it kind of looks like it's curved out. And oh, yeah, to kind of pull the belly in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, pull mean? the yeah. stomach mm -hmm. in a lot. Mm -hmm. And some, some coaches, this is their style. You see it in some specific schools, and some people just do it naturally. And if you look at their rib cage, their rib cage looks like it's expanded in a kind of barrel shape. And some people, when they do this, it'll mean the, it almost looks like they've sucked their organs. They've done like Nauli Kiria, if you're familiar with that, and the yogis who are listening. And it kind of looks like the rib cage is flared out. And in some people who haven't got a full expansion of the ribs around in this, it'll look like your floating ribs are sticking out a bit. Uh, you know, so that's just one thing to consider there. Uh, other than that, like the test with the wall, where you take the legs out of it, you set up and you go, you know, can I get a open shoulder position with my ribs down? What does that look like? Can I get a perfect handstand alignment in this upside down handstand, basically? If you can, then it is just basically a matter of strength more than anything else and close the shoulders. Like it's, yeah, as Mika said, it's epidemic. People like you push and then you push a bit further. And what actually happens is you push up and back and yeah, you think you you're contracted far. yeah and boom it's almost like i know open shoulders open your shoulders is such a cue we give to beginners and you know people who might be a bit tighter but i think open shoulders is epidemic in the handstand world yeah i think i think it's 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 at least uh misunderstood what it means because like you just it it ends up going too far into into flexion so that you start like basically you can say it like this like the the place you want your shoulders to be in <clears throat> in a handstand is not the same place you want your shoulders to be in in a bridge in a bridge you you by the like you by default you want to push the rib cage out behind your hands uh, or above the hands and you want to like pull the sternum away 
and this is what do, what you don't want in a handstand. To be able to close this point, you need to then, if you lift arms overhead and you go into a reasonable degree of flexion, as I mentioned before, uh, so that you're flexing your arm overhead, it's elevated, and you pull your ribs in, you and you feel that your your arm is then closing. Uh, if you do this, and then on purpose, you go there, you allow the, the arm to close, and try to pull your shoulder further backwards with only muscle force. And you'll feel this kind of in the neck muscles, and the traps will be what will do this, because you're not allowed to move the sternum further backwards, you're only allowed to move the hand further backwards by the flexion. And uh, how this ex ex expresses when all the weight is on your hands is that your mid traps will need to do this very, like to pull very hard to be able to bring these la or to squeeze these last centimeters out of your um, out of your shoulder flexion. And hence, as as Emmett said, like your your shoulders are in a, in a kind of extreme position and they need to work really hard there. It's 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 tough for them. So like one of one of the best things you can do for this is this tuck slides on the wall because then you're setting yourself up in a position where the shoulders are, are forced into this closed alignment, uh, and the, sh the legs start sliding down the wall in front of you, and that creates the dilemma for the body, that either you fall on your face, or you flex really hard from the shoulders to be able to maintain this handstand position. And as you then flex your shoulders really hard, guess what? You're building the strength to hold uh, the position that you want to be doing uh, in an actual handstand uh, context. So it's there are many other things that also go into this, like we've talked about before, like the um, the structure of the elbow as like uh, uh, can affect usually how much you need to move into flexion. So if you want to hear more about that, you can check out the episode on anatomical variation we, we did before. We discussed that in detail there, which basically means that some people need less flexion per definition than others to reach this center of mass over base of support kind of position, which is not about how the line looks looks on the back of the body, but where the force travels through the body. So it's a seemingly like it's it's kind it's funny because it's a seemingly simple concept that is more complicated than it looks like, but it's not complicated in the way that people think. People go to handstand and think, oh yeah, I need to close my ribs, and they try to mystically do something about the ribs. You can't move it unless you move the shoulders, and that is not about closing the shoulders as you do in a planche, because then you allow the shoulder flexion to move. This is allowing, uh, this is pulling the sternum back, which closes the shoulder angle by itself. And then you need to pull that rest of um, the angle from your traps, basically. Yeah. I think that basically it covers kind it. of sums it up. It's, it's, it takes some time to develop tuck slides on the wall or one of your best yeah. options to build the strength to do so. Yeah, tuck slides lat stretches as well like mm. it, if, if you're talking more about this case of just like you're just not flexible enough stretch your lats and your mm. pec minor mm. that's the key thing to work on i have them on my youtube already but other than that assuming you have the flexibility for straight handstand it is shoulder flexion strength and correct positioning of the shoulders and everything upstream on a handstand if anything is going jank in your handstand always look downstream it's always built on that foundation mm. ah cool next question we have a long one, but I have a simple answer to it. <laughs> uh, I've had a consistent handstand and handstand related mobility practice guided by a quality teacher for about 18 months now. Uh, up until recently, my mobility practice has been just a complement to the handstand practice. But after seeing and feeling some very encouraging results, I've become very interested in giving my mobility work a bit more attention. In particular, understanding it a bit more intellectually slash scientifically. Uh, would you happen to have some top book suggestions to begin my quest? Yes, yes, I do. I have uh, two books that I like to recommend. There's three actually, but uh, two main ones for sort of hobbyist practitioners. One by Granddaddy Thomas Kurtz, uh, Stretching Scientific or Stretching Scientifically by Thomas Kurtz. Uh, fantastic book, fantastic man, very generous with his information, uh, very still on point with a lot of the things he talks about i'd argue i'd argue over the finer details of the application and these kind of things but you know as a groundwork of a book great the other book which i recommend is what covers the other side of stretching i suppose is kit lachlan who i don't know i haven't given him a title i suppose i should give kit a title uh 
I'll think of that later. But Kit, you're getting a title if you're listening in. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, so Kit Lachlan, oh, Stretch Therapy fame, it has a book called Stretching and Flexibility, and it is an introduction to their method of stretch therapy. Uh, what I like about these two books is we have Stretching Scientific, where Stretching Scientifically has a great quote in it saying, partner stretching is ultimately dangerous and a waste of time, don't do it. And Kit Lachlan has a, basically exclusively uses partner stretching methodologies. Uh, <laughs> not all of them, but uh, basically uses them and has an equal number of results. I think Kit, over the years of when he was running his gym, focused on stretching and bodyweight training, had 20,000 people through the doors to refine his method. So he's a man worth listening to. Uh, Thomas Kurtz has probably trained an equal number of people in martial arts using his methods. So he's also a man worth listening to. Uh, when you combine these two books together and combine the methodologies, you begin to get like a greater view of the potential uses of stretching and flexibility training. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. These are yeah, pretty good. They're my an class. actual answer to your question. Yeah, and I think if you check out on Kit's website, which is kitlockland.com or possibly .net or, or one of them anyway, they were giving away a free copy of his book via PDF. Now I'm not sure that will go on forever, but it was kind of uh, keep you entertained during Corona times kind of thing. So uh, try grab it if you can. It's and you know they normally sell it a print on demand as well. It's well worth getting. Same with Thomas Curse. You know if you're serious about training, his book should be on your library list uh yeah other than that get there uh plug myself i have launched my modern methods of mobility website which is uh coming soon and that will have a lot more information as well hopefully at some point I have yes. to finish writing some articles <laughs> it's so difficult to write i hate to <laughs> but i do love doing it for you guys so i will uh okay next question uh oh this is a good one i've heard long uh, training sessions mentioned a few times four to five hours how do you recommend someone keeps focus and energy for a training session that long? Do you snack or eat at certain points? Smoke slash caffeine throughout? Smoke what is my question. <laughs> <laughs> smoke methamphetamine should be yeah. fine. Uh, we smoke glass during these sessions. Not recommended. Um, uh, not recommended, but we do it. <laughs> <laughs> People think we're joking. Yeah. Uh, I have to finish this question. And how would it compare to doing two sessions a day? I find it hard to warm up my wrists and elbows for a second session in one day. Thanks, guys. So I would say like, yes, there is this classic thing. Uh, let's go on Instagram and say, oh, check me out. I train for X hours a day. And then people think, oh, shit, someone trades X hours a day. I probably should also train all these hours a day because that's going to make give me greater results. And that's not necessarily the case. I used to train many hours too, and sometimes I still do. Uh, but first of all, this is very individual, um, depending on your level of practice. And uh, it's, f- first of all, do you have time for it? Do you have the energy for it? Uh, like when I was 19 and doing breakdancing, yes, I had the energy for it. And I would smash like that every single day. Uh, I would st- do that in circus school as well. Nowadays, I don't like, I don't see the point. And like, I can get more or less the same amount of stuff done with much fewer hours and like just don't need as many sets uh like it's like i I think i think there is this um uh idea that like the more you get done in the session the more sets etc etc the better results you are going to get and whereas there's something to it like i think there's it's usually overestimated because like you have a limited amount of recovery in a week uh and you need to factor in like how much time you need to take off and so on and so on. And I think that like there is definitely an argument to be made for spending a little bit less uh, time on it. And I would say unless unless you are an advanced practitioner that are also kind of in your, your early to mid 20s, uh, meaning that you are just full of force and drive and energy and can go (laughs) forever yeah yeah, sure then you can do some of those sessions but i don't think that is like something to aim for just because like a lot of the best people say that they do so yeah Uh, i think also be useful here just to explain what actually happens in a circus performers training session when they're talking about i train for four hours a day like a lot of people who particularly come from fitness world think like People are sitting down with a piece of paper and smashing out sets and reps and timed and working on the same frequency that you would in a gym workout. That's not really how we work out in the circus world. Like you will come in, 
let's just say there's no one there to distract you and you're just going to do your training. You will do a warm up that will generally be some kind of dynamic stretching. Some people like to sit in stretches, whatever. You want to loosen out and get into kind of ready to train mode, whatever that entails for whatever you're doing. You will do your dis- discipline specific training. And that can be a very amount of time, generally one and a half to two hours. The discipline specific training, because people are working on different qualities a lot of the time. You're not just working pure strength. You're like working on the aesthetics of your movements. You're working on how things look. You're working on linkages between moves you can always do. So you're working on things that are a lot of time very sub-maximal. And you built up work capacity for quite a long time. So you can just do a lot of this because it's easy. Because that's what you're looking for when you're a performer is to make things easy, not harder. Mm. So you've made all these movements easier. You've worked on the efficiency of them. So you can do a lot. So it's almost like comparing a power lifter to a farmer. Like farmers yeah. are pretty strong. They can go for days. They may not be as strong as a power lifter. Some of them probably are. But they can just do a lot of work in the day. So it's the same with a circus performer. Then you've done your kind of like your main bit of your discipline skill training. After your skill training, you probably want to take a break, chat with whoever's in the hall. I uh, believe Mikhail has referred to a uh, handstand training should be like a tea party <laughs> in uh, <laughs> terms of intensity. And that's kind of it is because like you want to be fully recovered. You want to be fully rested. People take longer resets. Very long breaks. Yeah. yeah. You know, when people are training in circus school and stuff like that, there's a coach there, they generally take less breaks. But when they're training by themselves, you, like you see the training, the sets per hour go down, but it allows a better quality work. Then once you've done that, then you're going to do your physical training for the day, like your strength or conditioning or flexibility training or all of them. So you might do, oh, I'll do some flexibility training. Then I'll finish with some strength. I know it sounds in a weird order, but that's the order people train a lot in circus school. Because uh, flexibility is higher up our hierarchy of value than strength. Once you've got enough strength, yep. and then in the strength, people aren't smashing themselves. They're kind of because you already don't have a lot of energy in the session because you've already done a lot. So people are training quite moderately on the conditioning. I'd say, and I'd say the people yeah. who, like, both because they don't know how to fucking condition yeah. very often. Too, I would have to say, like it's more just like, <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I should do some pull-ups because, uh, yeah, I should do some pull-ups. I should do, pull up. I should do 50 sets of crunches because everyone says that strong core. It's like, it's like some, some of the younger guys I've been training with, they're just like, oh, yeah, came came in at 11 and then I did like a bunch of hand-to-hand and then like I did strength training. Yeah, I had a banana like, I'm just going to have a coffee and I'm going to train handstands. And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I remember I was also like that when I was younger, but like it's not necessarily a very good idea just to, just to do a bunch because like th- th- there is this thing that is called recovery and super compensation and to some degree you you need to adhere to that if you are going to make progress neither either on like a technical and neurological level or just on kind of like muscle building brute force uh way or even flexibility so like like if you come in and you are going to do the same kind of rhythm every single day and like train six hours, you're not going to last. So that is the question. Like, are you going to build a sustainable practice that you can do often enough uh, to be making progress? Um, or are you going to make a, a routine that is about doing a lot of hours because doing a lot of hours is kind of like this thing of symbolic value? Yeah. Uh, that that I think is is a is a question, and 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 then the, it also comes down to like people who, like for example, when I'm in the circus hall, I'm very often in the circus hall for like six hours, and I train maybe a couple of hours handstand, I stretch for an hour, I do, like okay, I don't do a lot of acro, but maybe I go do like some dance work or some like the floor, like some dance acro or practice some like breaking power moves or something, and like suddenly I've been there for six hours, and I've been at training quote unquote for a bunch of hours but you, i haven't been training hardcore so I, I do think there's definitely uh a case to be made for like sh- much shorter hand balancing sessions uh like and take my training today as an example like i was maybe training for two and a half hours or so but i did stretching for maybe half an hour to just loosen up i felt really stiff and awkward in the beginning did a couple of two arms started doing some one arms and just like feeling how they felt and i sat around and chilled like i didn't don't i didn't do a, a lot like my total amount of sets couldn't have been many um but 
I was there for quite some time because the things I was working on was like moderately uh, technically complex in relation to what I do. So like I could have stayed there for a lot longer, but I know that I have things to do tomorrow um, that are training related. So um, it's about kind of energy management and uh, being smart with it, like in relation to the stuff that you are going to do through a week, because some of it might be strength related. Some of it might be like high technical focus and so on. So you you need to kind of um, manage that. And that is complicated with handstand training, but don't think that just because you're adding more hours in there that you're being smarter with it. Like there's yeah. like the correlation is rather in the other direction when it comes to being smart versus spending a lot of time, I would say. Yeah, it's definitely a, not to take shots at anyone, but uh, I know a lot of the movement people. I, you know, I know who they are. I know how they train. I have trained with them. There is a lot of people who were promoting this train twice a day stuff, and you know, a lot of them actually weren't training twice a day. They've done it for brief periods over the course of the year. They might train twice a day, and they might do that for six to twelve weeks, and then something would happen. They'd be either on tour, or they'd be doing something else, and then they couldn't train twice a day, or they just deloaded, or they got an injury or something like that so it's one of these virtues that gets promoted but at the end of the day it's it can be sustainable but a lot of times it's just not it's also like you can you have you begin to see a shift in movement and movement training and body weight training as well from the people who were promoting twice a day are now promoting uh you know training body parts or patterns once a week or once every 10 days and stuff like that. And it's really funny for me. I see this as like, it's like watching bodybuilding from the 70s and 80s when uh, they were doing these mega volume workouts, mega volume, everyone was overtrained. And then they, Mike Metzer came along with heavy duty training. It was like train a body part once every two weeks for one set total to failure. And people jumped on the train and then started uh, getting gains again because they're fully recovering and resting and mm. this kind of thing. So you're seeing that a bit with a few of the people who were a few years ago promoting train twice a day, hard as you can kind yeah. of things. And they've kind of shifted to a... Yeah, and also relating to that question that we just got now, like, yeah, it's, I find it hard to train twice a day and it's difficult to warm up. You have your symptoms right there, Mr. or Miss or whoever yeah. you are. Like, it's very simple. If you feel that this isn't really, like, it's hard for you to train twice a day, it's very simple. Drop it. Like, you have <laughs> no business training twice a day then if you feel that this is taking the toll on your body trained once a day like it's it's you you can get the same stuff done and you will likely be getting better quality work in your sessions because you have more time to to recover and like particularly training handstands twice a day is a dumb idea unless you are either super conditioned for this kind of work uh or yeah you are on the younger end of the spectrum like this yeah. is this is something that people are also like there, there is a tradition of like, yeah, yeah, age is just a number. No, it's like it's a biological factor. So just factor it in. Like it doesn't mean that you like, like everyone hates getting worse with age. Like, but it is something that is going to happen at some day, some some stage or other. So if you factor it in and you allow yourself to, like, it's not about oh making excuses. It's about just be realistic with where you're at. And I can promise you that like. I've taken this example before in this podcast and practically wherever I go. When I was 19 years old, I'd come into breaking practice. The music was booming. I remember it very distinctly. I put down my back backpack. I did two steps of top rocks and I would I would throw flares from 10 minus outside in Oslo. <laughs> like flares directly. Boom, 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 boom. Go, 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 go. No problem. Like if I'd throw one flare now, even when like moderately warmed up, I'd get fucked up. Like, Maybe you need to go back to Oslo in the minus 10. Yeah. <laughs> You're like living a too comfortable life. I think the, the funny thing like is that like there. if I take two weeks of like working on flares now, I'll have better flares than I had when I was 19. But I need to dynamically warm up my hips. I need to just get in the zone for doing the move. Like I can like and regardless of how how warmed up or like how to say how recovered I was before I come in. Like I guess I've I've tried this. I've tried to throw flares at like semi-warm at probably a hundred different occasions the last couple of years it doesn't work but give me them the time i need now and i can do it but it isn't it isn't sustainable nor smart or possible even to do it properly 
uh, unless I'm very conditioned for it specifically and that I've taken my time getting ready for it. So rather than kind of looking upon it as like like quote unquote warm up, meaning that like the, the standardized idea of like, I go do some biking until I'm sweating warm up. It's a different thing than like, like I, I like to refer it as readiness. Like you need to be in like, be ready for doing whatever you are going to do. And like, this is very individual, but also depending on like the like level of dynamism and like ranges that you're using. Like I never need to warm up to do like a planche. My best planche is always on the second try I've found, regardless <laughs> of like, like I don't, cause like since I turn out my hands in, in planche and since all I do is put the arms in front of me, like I could probably right now on Emmett's floor right here, do like a pretty decent planche because I don't think there's space on my floor, yeah. but you know, like right there, if I do it diagonally yeah. there, I wouldn't kick your TV, <laughs> but like, I am like, I don't need a lot of warm up for that. I don't need a lot of warm up for a front lever either, even though I'm garbage at front levers, like comparatively speaking, like I can always do kind of my best set at the first or second attempt. Planche must be like the second or third. Like if it's a figa, like I'm much better at the figa than I am at the planche. But I'll I'll need to get I'll need to get into my body. I'll need to get like to allow myself to work in that range which a figa requires. And uh, yeah, like fucking hell for a flare, a lot more. I need to have that <laughs> readiness. So yeah, a lot of stuff to be said about that. But plain and simple, like if it's not working out for you to do two sessions a day, don't do two sessions a day. Yeah, voila. One good session beats two shit sessions. Yep. That beats three shit sessions as well. Uh, one last question for this podcast. Flagging in one arm. Why is it so hard to breed? Because you're bending a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Basically like <laughs> bending your ribs. It's hard to for turning into our breed. podcast. I've got to let you on a big secret in flagging. The trick of the flag is to get in and out of the flag fast enough that you get an applause from the audience, but you just don't have to inhale or exhale during it. <laughs> just one, two, three, okay, clap, get out. Yeah. Now, like it's it's actually uh, it's like that with any any kind of high tension loads of um, how to call it. You're you're in kind of an let's call it an extreme position for the body to be in, and like I don't need to. I have no problems whatsoever breathing in a flag, but I remember having problems breathing in a flag when I was learning it. But I have problems breathing in a Mexican because I never train Mexicans. <laughs> Ask someone who's good at Mexicans they can breathe in a Mexican. So it's kind of this, like the experience of learning these movements is that, and I like years ago when I had like a decent Mexican, I didn't have a problem breathing in it because like when you're moving into these ranges, you're going to tense up a lot more than you actually need. And over time, you, you're like, your body allows you to, to kind of just hang out in this position and naturally your breath will be fine. Just as someone who's like, they get their first like, five second handstand better you bet your ass they're gonna hold their breath yeah. and they're going to have the feeling that oh, holy shit if i breathe i'm gonna fall and like give them like a bunch of conditioning and a bunch of work on it so that like they're starting to be comfortable in the range they're just going to be able to breathe and like suddenly breathing just doesn't become a thing i never think about breathing in handstand it's just kind of like this shallow breath thing that like i remember like a couple of weeks ago here i was doing I was working on doing like the one arm pike press again with a counterweight. And yeah. it was interesting because when I was doing it, like I did maybe like three, four repetitions with a counterweight that, that session. And I was experiencing myself breathing. Like I was going into the, the one arm L sit and I would remember myself going like, <laughs> like just these yeah. small breaths. Cause I mean, I ha need to, to inhale a bit, but I can't have like the, <sighs> yeah, can't be long breaths, but I was like, oh shit. I'm, 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 now my, my attention was actually on it because like, I was doing something new and like, of course, a lot of maximal tension during, during this movement. And I was suddenly aware of myself doing that. Whereas like, uh, now I'm thinking back to my session today when I was doing like one arm switches on a block, like I have no a memory of breathing during that set. <laughs> Though I was up there for, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds. And I was certainly breathing during that time, but you're just not aware of it because you're comfortable in the zone. So yeah. it's something that comes over time. Yeah, it's definitely one of these things that, particularly with the bendy shapes, Mexicans and flags, one of the things I say to people in this is open your mouth slightly and let the air be squished out of you by the bending. 
And what this will do it means you're not overly pressurizing the ribs or anything like this, particularly when learning. It goes out the window when you're advanced, as Mikhail says. But let the bending of your back or your side squish the air out of you. And it will only squish as much air out. And what you'll be left with is this little reserve zone that you can breathe in and out of. And you won't have an air pocket to work around, if that's the correct term. But uh, that definitely helps. Uh, one of the other things is just like static flags that are sub-maximally deep. So if you could imagine, I don't know, you can bend to 20 centimeters, whatever, we'll just make this up. Bend to underneath that to 10 centimeters and practice breathing there. And just get mm -hmm. used to breathing in a sub-maximal one. And then when you get deeper, you'll be able to get it. But it does come down to this thing like I was saying. It's like if it is a maximal move, either in terms of intensity of shoulder push or intensity of bending, you're going to be hard to breathe in. And this is for everything. Like if yeah. your max deadlift is 100 kilos, mm. and then you try to max that, it's going to be difficult to breathe. If your max deadlift is 200 kilos, and then you lift 100, it's going to be very easy yeah, to breathe in it. So yeah, flag more. Yeah, I, and I think like you, one thing you can do, just practically speaking as well, is just do like, because you specifically mentioned one arm flags, do like do two arm flags. Like get really, really good at, at breathing and two arm in like a two arm position there, so that like you you feel comfy and then then you can breathe there. And like actually, when I think about it now, like I've recently kind of like from a, I think I've mentioned this before too. Like I've started to work back my flags on left arm, which have yeah. been really terrible uh, because of like an old side injury. Um, that now has like started to clear up really well and i'm really flexible bending towards uh towards my left side again and like i've experienced like the last times i've done full flags on my left i've just been like oh hey i just feel i'm bending in the side again and not actually feeling this massive amount of pressure around the around the side and around the spine and like suddenly like when i was there i guess okay i'm just breathing like like normal and like the, the the flag is it's like since the flexibility is limited, it's not it's not looking perfect, but it's feeling good. Yeah. Like it's it just has that kind of okay, I go there and I hang out kind of quality, rather than the like I am here under extreme pressure. Like it, like basically, it shouldn't feel like you're in some sort of like in the conditions that is producing a diamond. And you should just be like, oh yeah, I just bent and I'm chilling out. So, but don't expect that feeling to be there in the beginning until the thing is easy for you. Just like the analogy I M M Emmett just had of a deadlift is is very safe, like it's very sound. Like if you're lifting your max, just don't don't expect to to be chilling. Yeah. Cool. That was uh, it for all our questions for this episode. Oh sweet. Yeah. Nice forty minutes. Grand. In and out. Uh so as usual, uh, if you want to support the podcast and support us and hopefully aid us in our acquisition of some uh, battle cats. Yes, we are both aiming for that. Uh, please buy one of our programs at Hands and Factory. Other than that, if you have some questions you want to ask us, uh, you can DM them to us directly, or you can DM them to Hands and Factory on Instagram. Uh, you can also there's a contact form on the website that I forgot to mention. Uh, yeah, and voice questions, you know, send them into us as well. Yeah, so that uh, I can buy main coons. Yeah, like our goal in life is to both have two main coons. Yes. Yeah. Most important thing. Yeah, if you have a Maine Coon and you would like to share your pictures of your cat with us, send them. Please, please send please, them please, in. Please, 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 please. DM them to Mikhail. If you have an impressive dog, DM them to me as well. Uh, or if you just have a dog you like to share, send them to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> please post dog to me. Uh, yeah. All right. Anyway, that. Thank you for listening to us ramble for a bit. Uh, other than that, we'll speak to you next week. Cheers. <laughs>